Anne Frank, bottom page 101. Sunday, June 13th, 1943. Dearest Kitty, the poem father composed for my birthday is too nice to keep to myself. Since Pim writes his verses only in German, Margot volunteered to translate it into Dutch. See for yourself whether Margot hasn't done herself proud. It begins with the usual summary of the year's events and then continues. As youngest among us, but small no more, your life can be trying, for we have the chore. Of becoming your teacher is a terrible bore. We've got experience, take it from me. We've done this all before, you see. We know the ropes, we know the game. Since time immoral, always the same. One's own shortcomings are nothing but fluff. But everyone else are heavier stuff. Fault finding comes easy when this is our plight, but it's hard for our pure parents, try us as they might, to treat you with fairness and kindness as well. Nitpicking's a habit that's hard to dispel when you're living with old folks. All you can do is put up with their nagging. It's hard, but it's true. The pill may be better, but down it must go, for it's meant to keep the peace, you know. The many months here have been in vain since wasting time goes against your grain and you read and study nearly all the day determined to chase the boredom away the more difficult question the much harder to bear is what on earth do i have to wear i've got no more panties my clothes are too tight my shirt is a loincloth i'm really a sight to put on my shoes must cut off my toes so dear i'm plagued with so many woes margo had trouble getting the part about food to rhyme so i'm leaving it out but aside from that don't you think it's a good poem for the rest, I've been thoroughly spoiled and have received a number of lovely presents, including a big book on my favorite subject, Greek and Roman mythology. Nor can I explain about the lack of candy. Everyone had dipped into the last reserves. As the Benjamin of the Annex, I got more than I deserve. Yours, Anne. Tuesday, June 15th, 1943. Dearest Kitty, heaps of things have happened, but I have to think I'm boring you with my dreary chit-chat, and that you'd just be just as soon have fewer letters, so I'll keep the news brief. Mr. Vosco wasn't operated on for his ulcer after all. Once the doctors had him on the operating table and opened him up, they saw that he had cancer. It was in such an advanced stage that an operation was pointless, so they stitched him up again, kept him in the hospital for three weeks, fed him well, and sent him back home. But they made an unforgivable error. They told the poor man exactly what was in store for him. He can't work anymore, and he's just sitting at home, surrounded by his eight children, brooding about his approaching death. I feel very sorry for him, and hate not being able to go out otherwise. I'd visit him as often as I could, and help take his mind off matters. Now the good man can no longer let us know what's being said and done in the warehouse, which is a disaster for us. Mr. Vosco was our greatest source of help and support when it came to safety measures. We miss him very much. Next month is our turn to hand over our radio to the authorities. Mr. Clement has a small set hidden in a home that he's giving us to replace our beautiful cabinet radio. It's a pity we have to turn in our big Phillips, but when you're in hiding, you can't afford to bring the authorities down on your heads. Of course, we'll put the baby radio upstairs with a Clydesdale radio when there's already Clanston Jews and Clanston money. All over the country, people are trying to get hold of an old radio they can hand over instead of their moral booster. It's true. As the reports from outside grow worse and worse, the radio with its wondrous voice helps us not to lose heart and to keep telling ourselves, cheer up, keep your spirits high, things are bound to get better. Yours, Anne. Sunday, July 11th, 1943. Dearest Kitty, to get back to the subject of child rearing for the umpteenth time, let me tell you that I'm going to do my best to be helpful, friendly, and kind and do all I can to keep the rain of rebukes down to a light drizzle. It's not easy trying to behave like a model child with people you can't stand, especially when you don't mean a word of it. But I can see that a little hypocrisy gets me a lot further than my old methods of saying exactly what I think, even though no one ever asks my opinion or cares one way or another. Of course, I often forget my role and find it impossible to curb my anger when they're unfair so that they spend the next month saying i'm the most impertinent girl in the world don't you think i'm to be pitied sometimes it's a good thing i'm not the grouchy type because then i might become sour and bad-tempered 
I can usually see the humor side of their scoldings, but it's easier than somebody else is being raked over the coals. Further, I've decided, after a great deal of thought, to drop the shorthand first, so that I have more time for my other subjects on second because of my eyes. It's a sad story. I've become very nearsighted and should have glasses ages ago. Ugh, won't I look like a dope? But as you know, people in hiding can't. Yesterday, all anyone here could talk about was Anne's eyes because Mother had suggested they go to the ophthalmologist with Miss Kleinman. Just hearing this made my knees weak since it's no small matter. Going outside, just think of it. Walking down the street, I can't imagine it. I was petrified at first and then glad, but it's not as simple as all that. The various authorities who have to approach such a step were unable to reach a quick decision. They first had to carefully weigh all the difficulties and rest through, though me was ready to set off immediately with me in tow. In the meantime, I had taken my gray coat from the closet, but it was so small it looked as if it might have belonged to my sister. We lowered the hem, but it still couldn't button it. I'm really curious to see what they decide, only I don't think they'll ever work out a point because the bridge are related in Sicily and the father's all set for a quick finish. Bep's been giving Margot and me a lot of office work to do. It makes us both feel important and it's a big help to her. Anyone can find, can file letters and make entries in a sales book, but we can do it with remarkable accuracy. Meep has so much to carry. She looks like a pack mule. She goes forth nearly every day to scrounge up vegetables and then bicycles back with her purchases in large shopping bags. She's also the one who brings five library books with her every Sunday. We long for Saturdays because that means books. We're like a bunch of little kids with a present. Ordinary people don't know how much books can mean to someone who's cooped up. Our only diversions are reading, studying, and listening to the radio. Yours, Anne. Thursday, July 13th, 1943. The best little table. Yesterday afternoon, Father gave me permission to ask Mr. Dussel whether he would please please be so good as to allow me, seeing how polite I am, to use the table in our room two afternoons a week from 4 to 5.30. I already sit there every day from 2.30 to 4 while Dressel takes a nap, but the rest of the time the room and the table are off limits to me. It's impossible to study next door to in the afternoon because there's too much going on, besides Father sometimes likes to sit at the desk during the afternoon. So it seemed like a reasonable request, and I asked Dussel very politely, what do you think the learned gentleman's reply was? No, just plain no. I was incest and wasn't about to let myself be put off like that. I asked him the reason for this no, but this didn't get me anywhere. The gist of his reply was, I have to study too, you know, and if I can't do that in the afternoons, I won't be able to fit it in at all. I have to finish the task I've set for myself, otherwise there's no point in starting. Besides, you aren't serious about your studies. Mythology? What kind of work is that? Reading and knitting don't count either. I use that table and I'm not going to give it up. I replied, Mr. Russell, I do take my work seriously. I can't study next door in the afternoons and I would appreciate it if you would reconsider my request. Having said these words, the insulted Anne turned around and pretended the learned doctor wasn't there. I was seething with rage and felt that Dussel had been incredibly rude, which she certainly had been, and that I had been very polite. That evening, when I managed to get a hold of Pym, I told him what had happened and we discussed what my next step should be. Because I had no intention of giving up and preferred to deal with the matter myself, Pym gave me a rough idea of how to approach Dussel, but cautioned me to wait until the next day, since I was in such a flap. I ignored this last piece of advice and waited for Dussel after the dishes had been done. Pym was sitting next door and ha that had a calming effect. I began, Mr. Dussel. You seem to believe further discussion of this matter is pointless, but I beg you to reconsider. Dussel gave me the most charming smile and said, I'm most prepared to discuss the matter, even though it's already been settled. I went on talking, despite Dussel's repeated interruptions. When you first came here, I said, we agreed that the room was to be shared by the two of us. If we were to divide it fairly, you'd have the entire morning and I'd have the entire afternoon. I'm not asking for that much, but two afternoons a week does seem reasonable to me. Dussel leapt out of his chair as if he sat on a pin. You have no business talking about your rights to the room. Where am I supposed to go? Maybe I should ask Mr. Van Dan to build me a cubby hole in the attic. You're not the only one who can't find a quiet place to work. You're always looking <coughs> for a fight. If your sister Margot, who has more right to workspace than you do, had come to me with the same request, I'd never even have thought of refusing. But you... 
And once again, he brought up the business about the mythology and the knitting, and once again, Anne was insulted. However, I showed no sign of it and let Dussel finish, but no, it's impossible to talk to you. You're shamefully self-centered. No one else matters as long as you get your way. I've never seen such a child, but after all is said and done, I'll be obliged to let you have your way, since I don't want people saying later on that Anne Frey failed her exams because Mr. Dressel refused to relinquish his table. He went on and on. I saw there was such a deluge of words I could hardly keep up for one fleeting moment. I thought him and his lies. I'll smack his ugly mug so hard he'll go bouncing off the wall. But the next moment I thought, calm down. He's not worth getting so upset about. At long last, Mr. Dussel's fury was spent, and he left the room with an expression of triumph mixed with wrath, his coat pockets bulging with food. I went running over to Father and recounted the entire story, at least those parts he hadn't been able to follow himself. Pym decided to talk to Dussel that very same evening, and they spoke for more than half an hour. The first to discuss whether Anne should be allowed to use the table, yes or no. Father said that he and Dussel had dealt with the subject once before, at which time he professed to agree with Dussel because he didn't want to contradict the elder in front of the younger but that even then he hadn't thought it was fair Dussel felt i had no right to talk as if he were an intruder laying claim to everything inside but father protested strongly since he himself had heard me say nothing of the kind and so the conversation went back and forth the father defending my selfishness and my busy work and Dussel grumbling the whole time Dussel finally had to give in, and I was granted the opportunity to work without interruption two afternoons a week. Dussel looked really very sullen, didn't speak to me for two days, and made sure he occupied the table from 5 to 5.30, all very childish, of course. Anyone who's so petty and pedantic at the age of 54 was born that way and is never going to change.